So in this last uh, video of lecture 11, I want to talk a little bit about um, an aspect of the EIP 1559 proposal that really took on a life of its own, um, namely the idea that the base fee revenues get burned. Now remember, we actually saw, right, in our description of EIP 1559, the game theoretic reason why base fee revenues are burned in this transaction fee mechanism. Or at least if they're not burned, they have to be somehow withheld from the miner of a block. Because if those revenues are passed on to the miner of that block, then from off-chain collusion between that miner and the creators of transactions, they can ev evade any base fee you might try to set. So it's as if the base fee was zero and you're just back into a first price auction. All right, so if the base fee revenues are not passed on to the block's miner, where do they go? Well, there's various options, but EIP 1559 implements what's probably the simplest of them, which is those base fee revenues just get burned. So the coins used to pay the base fee are in fact removed from circulation permanently. So while my understanding is that the burning of the base fee revenues, I mean, that was introduced in the proposal for these exact game theoretic reasons, uh, there's actually a number of interesting consequences uh, of this design choice. First of all, you know, there's no doubt about it. I mean, this really is taking part of a revenue stream away from miners. Now, the end users, the creators of transactions, they're, they're still paying the same transaction fees as before. Um, so if the miners have lost, who has gained? Well, if you think about it, by taking coins permanently out of circulation, the indirect beneficiary is, in fact, all of the holders of the native currency. So one way to sort of understand this, you know, uh, for some of you, probably you want to think about an analogy um, with the equities world, specifically stock buybacks, um, which at least in principle uh, should have the uh, effect of raising the value of all the shares that remain uh, in circulation. For another way to think about it, you know, think about some kind of think about a cryptocurrency, you know, like, say, Ethereum's native currency um, and think about the market cap. You'd hope that you know, the market cap of a currency uh, would be independent of the unit in which you measure it, okay? which equivalently independent of the number of coins that happen to be in circulation. The market cap hopefully is dictated by things like demand for the currency uh, to, for example, pay for transactions to be executed on the blockchain, you know, or through kind of speculation about you know, what people think is going to happen to the market cap in the future. So then if you imagine uh, holding all factors other than the number of coins fixed, and in particular holding the market cap fixed, then if you, for example, suddenly cut the supply of circulating coins in half to get the same market cap, each of the remaining coins would have to have twice the price. So this is the int intuition why um, burning these fees, taking these coins out of circulation, uh, in principle benefits all of the holders of the currency. The remaining coins in circulation uh, should hopefully be worth more. Now, just to be clear, I mean, remember, while it's true that base fee revenues are getting burned, coins are being taken out of circulation, uh, there is still the block reward, right? So with every block, two new ethers are being minted from thin air. And so that's an inflationary force. So on the one hand, you've got the block reward printing new coins. You've got the burn base fee revenues taking away other coins. You know, and either one of these numbers could be bigger than the other. Most blocks so far, the block reward has been more uh, than the amount of burned base fee revenues. But there's also been some blocks where it's been the reverse. But to date, the aggregate effect of this, um, of this fee burning, of the base fee revenues, uh, has been to decrease the inflation rates of Ethereum from what it used to be, which was roughly 4%, to about half that, so to about 2%. But either way, you know, the principle is, is, is still the same, that because you are not printing coins as rapidly as you would have been pre-EIP 1559, uh, the switch in transaction fee mechanism uh, should be beneficial to all holders uh, of Ethereum's native currency. And indeed, you know, in the community discussion around this sort of potential change in the transaction fee mechanism, you know, as you can imagine, you know, the loudest negative voices tended to be from miners, tended to be from parties who were, you know, understandably upset about, you know, part of one of the revenue streams uh, being taken away. You know, on the other hand, lots of the other community members, you know, there were not miners and are in fact holders of the currency. Uh, so those voices were all, you know, quite strongly in favor um, of this aspect of the new transaction fee mechanism. 
The next point I want to mention is that, you know, so while it's true that, you know, part of the minor revenue stream is being um, taken away, it's actually probably not as big a fraction of the miners' overall revenue as you might have thought. In particular, even in a post EIP 1559 reward, miners still have multiple significant revenue streams. Okay, so first of all, we of course should not neglect to mention the block reward. Right? So you mine a block, no matter what's in the block, no matter what the base fee is, you will be the miner of that block will be getting that block reward of two ether. So several years ago, almost all of miners' revenue was coming from block rewards anyways, so they wouldn't have actually maybe cared that much about what was happening to the transaction fees. Um, these days, that's no longer true. Block rewards um, haven't gone up, but transaction fees really have gone up. And in fact, in a typical block, you might expect the sum of the transaction fees to be ballpark, you know, the same kind of uh, rough value as the block reward, maybe, you know, roughly uh, 2 ETH in a block. But still, by keeping the block rewards, that is at least 50% of the miner's previous revenue stream, uh, which is a good start. But that's not all. So secondly, while the base fee revenues are indeed burned, base fee is not the entirety of the transaction fees. So uh, remember, creators of transactions are free to bid more than the base fee if they want, uh, and any excess bid over the base fee is in fact transferred to the miner, just as transaction fees uh, always had been in first price auctions. So this is a second, uh, actually fairly significant source of revenue uh, for miners in a post EIP 1559 world. All right, but so why would any why would any user uh, bid strictly more than the base fee? Why would they offer to pay uh, more than the minimum that they had to? Uh, well, there's I want to mention three reasons, two of which we've already seen uh, previously in the lecture. All right, so first of all, there is this kind of regime where the current base fee R is excessively low, uh, meaning that the miner is not going to have room, even in a double full block, to accommodate all of the eligible transactions, all of the transactions that bid R or more. So when you're in this regime, like for example, if there's just been the sort of sudden you know, NFT drop and all of a sudden demand is really high, um, then you're actually going to have to compete with other transactions for inclusion in a double full block, um, just as one used to in a first price auction for a normal size block. And in that case, in that case where you have excessively low base fees, you would expect to see bids potentially significantly higher uh, than the base fee, because that's what's going to be required due to the competition uh, for transaction inclusion. The second reason we, we saw, which is maybe less significant, um, but still, we mentioned how even in the good regime where the base fee is not excessively low and the miner actually has room in a double full block to accommodate everybody willing to pay the base fee, you know, from the user perspective, you probably still want to put a small tip above and beyond the base fee, um, just so that the miner isn't sort of indifferent between including you or not including you, right? You don't want the miners just sort of mining empty blocks, collecting the block reward and sort of going home. You do want them to actually pack their blocks as full as possible with eligible transactions. And so you do in practice see sort of small tips above and beyond the base fee, even uh, in times of stable demand uh, and good base fees. The third reason is something we, we haven't talked about to this point. Um, we'll talk about it you know, more when we get to the decentralized finance um, part of the lecture series toward the end uh, of the series. But it turns out there's certain transactions for which the creator not only wants them included in the next block, but also wants you know, special treatment. And so one you know, canonical form of special treatment is you might want your transaction to be the very first one in a block, right? So suppose you're trying to sort of, you know, purchase some one of a kind item, you know, only the first person who submits the transaction buying it will succeed. And you want to be that first person at the very beginning uh, of the block that gets mined. So this means that, you know, even when the base fee is not excessively low, even when there's room for everybody, you know, well, at first you might think all of the bids would be like the base fee R or maybe R plus a small amount delta. Um, actually, you may also have transactions that are paying way in excess of the base fee. So transferring a lot of money to the blocks miner in order to get this special treatment. And that can actually be a surprisingly significant source uh, of minor revenue. Finally, um, something we'll talk about at length toward the end of the lecture series, minor extractable value, uh, or MEV. So in MEV, you know, the miner is actually inspecting the contents uh, of the transactions it's thinking about putting into its block, uh, above and beyond just looking at what the bid of each transaction is. 
And there are certain types of transactions, I mean, especially, you know, those in decentralized finance and DeFi, you know, for example, trading on an automated, automated market maker, where the miner is actually in a position to benefit by perhaps putting some of its own transactions in the block, along with the other ones by other users uh, that it's going to put into its block. So, you know, one very uh, canonical example would be to front run a trade. Now, as I said, you know, we'll talk a lot more about minor extractable value toward the end of the uh, lecture series. But for now, I just want to point out this is a genuinely um, different third source of revenue. And in practice, this is actually quite significant. Miners make quite a bit of revenue um, due to MEV. So overall, you know, there's no question miners are suffering a sort of loss of revenue uh, through the switch to the transaction fee mechanism to EIP-1559. Um, however, all of this is meant to say, like, maybe it's not quite as catastrophic as it might have first struck you. Um, I would expect, you know, it's, it's quite hard to estimate exactly how much um, miners' revenue has changed. You know, but just to give very coarse guesses, I mean, I think it is certainly, you know, a double digit drop in revenue, you know, more than 10%. Um, but it seems also safe to say it's much, much less than, than 50% or something like that. So sort of low double digit percent um, drop in minor revenue. Now, if you think about it, an immediate consequence of uh, decreased profitability of mining for Ethereum is less people are going to mine. Right. So like imagine you're a miner, right? So you bought, you know, somewhere, you know, a bunch of ASICs, application specific integrated circuits um, for the purposes of mining Ethereum blocks. And imagine it was such that you were just barely covering your costs. Okay, So your revenue was kind of like roughly equal to your operating costs. Well, if that revenue drops, especially if it drops significantly, like say 20% or 30%, you're going to stop mining, right? You're going to switch off your ASICs so you don't have to pay the electricity bill, and you'll probably sort of resell the ASICs on a sort of secondhand market so you don't have to pay the depreciation either. Now, maybe you're worried at the prospect of like, okay, well, with a 30% drop in revenue, maybe actually all the miners are going to switch off their ASICs and nobody will be mining at all, which obviously would be a total disaster. But don't forget, there's sort of an interesting kind of feedback loop, okay, where as miners drop out, actually mining gets more profitable for the ones who remain. Why? Well, when miners exit, the hash rate drops. And remember, proof of work blockchains like today's Ethereum, they have difficulty adjustment algorithms to make sure that the blocks uh, stay being produced at a steady rate, like one every 13 seconds, uh, even as the hash rate changes. Now suppose, you know, I'm a miner and I actually stay in. I continue to hash with, with my same old set of ASICs. So I'm hashing at exactly the same rate that I was before. But by virtue of the crypto puzzles being easier to solve, each of my hashes is that much more likely to be a crypto puzzle solution. So each of my hashes is that much more likely to lead to me producing a block and reap all of the corresponding rewards. So on the one hand, because some of the transaction fee revenues are getting burned, when I successfully mine a block, I'm getting less money than I had been previously. But because some miners have exited the market, I'm going to be getting that somewhat reduced reward more frequently. So we're not worried about sort of all the miners fleeing. I mean, once enough miners drop out, it's still it's going to, you know, again, be profitable for the ones who remain. Um, but we would expect, you know, at the margin, miners to exit and stop mining and sort of switch off their machines. So we would expect a decrease in hash rates because of these burn transaction fee revenues. So why might we care uh, that the hash rate drops? Well, because that's sort of a corresponding drop in the level of security of the blockchain, right? So like, you know, think about an attacker trying to launch a 51% attack, right? So the less other hash rate there is mining on the blockchain, the less hash rate you're going to have to acquire in order to have a 51% share. In a couple lectures, in lecture 13, that's actually going to be all about, you know, what the economic security of a blockchain means. Um, so arguments like this about, you know, quantifying the cost of 51% attacks. Um, but for now, I hope it's sort of intuitively clear that, you know, the less people are actually mining, um, the easier it's going to be for some attacker to acquire 51% of the hash rate. And so in that sense, the blockchain becomes less secure than it had been. Now, interestingly, in all of the sort of heated debates around EIP-1559 and the Ethereum community, um, this sort of decrease in blockchain security, you know, it was discussed, but I wouldn't say it was like a big sticking point. It was a pretty common opinion um, among leaders in the Ethereum community that actually, you know, the block rewards alone should already incentivize sufficient hash rates um, to make Ethereum sufficiently secure.
Now, you know, I, I think reasonable people could sort of debate um, this point. Uh, but, you know, my guess is sort of the reasoning behind this would be, you know, like think back to 2019. It's like, okay, you know, Ethereum was not as valuable in 2019 as it is now, but it was still pretty valuable. Um, and moreover, in 2019, the transaction fees, they weren't zero, but they, they were close enough to zero. So minor uh, rewards really dominated um, just by the block rewards. And so if everything seemed to work fine in 2019 with near zero transaction fees, why wouldn't everything work fine now um, with almost all the transaction fees being burned? I suspect that was the, that sort of the intuition backing um, this sort of very common belief. So that wraps up, you know, what I wanted to tell you about the, you know, some of the main points in the discussion around EIP 1559 that were happening in the Ethereum community um, in 2020 and 2021, when there was, they're trying to decide whether or not to deploy this new transaction fee mechanism. Let me conclude just by saying, you know, as, as someone who was sort of watching this discussion unfold from the sidelines, it was hard to not be super impressed with the depth and detail of the community discussion around whether or not Ethereum should deploy EIP-1559. And it was actually a real eye-opener for me, and I was really pretty amazed how you could have, you know, a protocol or a network like Ethereum, which on the one hand, you know, is so valuable to so many people, and you have such different types of stakeholders, um, and moreover, you don't have any central decision maker, sort of, you know, there's no one person deciding whether or not, you know, Ethereum is going to make some upgrade or not. Um, and yet still, in this kind of really quite distributed fashion, uh, they managed to implement this really major update uh, to the Ethereum protocol. Really kind of incredible that, that they could pull this off. So that wraps up everything I wanted to say about transaction fees in general and about the mechanism in EIP 1559 uh, in particular. And next, in lecture 12, we're going to have our third lecture in this four-lecture series on economics of blockchains and sort of functionality enabled by having a native currency. Uh, and we're going to focus on a really major and really important topic in lecture 12, uh, namely proof-of-stake blockchains. Okay, proof-of-stake is an alternative civil resistance mechanism uh, to proof-of-work, which uses radically less energy consumption and looks to be extremely important uh, going forward. So I'll see you there.